Section 25 of My Musical Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Musical Life by Walter Damrosch. Chapter 18, Boston. In 1887, I visited Boston for the first time professionally. I had begun my Wagnerian lecture recitals in New York a year or two before, and they had spread like wildfire in all directions. The enthusiasm for Wagner, which had been kindled into a bright flame by my father's founding of German opera at the Metropolitan Opera House, had produced a widespread desire for better acquaintance with Wagner's music and his theories regarding the music drama. I received an invitation from a group of Boston women, including Mrs. John L. Gardner, Mrs. O. B. Frothingham, Mrs. George Tyson, and Mrs. Henry Whitman, to give my lecture recitals on the Nibelungen Trilogy. Boston at that time occupied a unique position as the only city in America which possessed a permanent orchestra, maintained by Major Henry Lee Higginson, for the cultivation of symphonic music. A small group of highly educated and socially prominent Boston Bostonians, belonging to the oldest New England families, made this orchestra almost the focus of their social life. The weekly concerts were the great events, the programs eagerly discussed, and its conductor Wilhelm Gericke was alternately cursed or blessed according to their attitude toward some novelty which he had just produced. Among this group I was made heartily welcome. The atmosphere was intensely local, if not provincial, and as against the searching, feverish life of a great metropolis like New York, with its many conflicting interests and racial currents, the tranquility and purely American quality of Boston life, as it presented itself to me, was a complete contrast. I am speaking of Boston of 35 years ago, and of conditions that have, to a certain extent, disappeared. For today, even the young descendants of the New Englanders of that era seem to find their pleasures in different and more restless fashion. In the group of which I have spoken, Mrs. Gardner was among the most original and fascinating. She was certainly the leaven in the Boston lump, and sometimes shocked the more staid element by her innovations and interest in more modern currents in art and literature than had hitherto rippled its calm Embersonian surface. Boston was at that time perhaps the best example of that typically American musical culture of which I have spoken elsewhere, which instead of growing upward from the masses, was carefully introduced and nurtured by an aristocratic and cultivated community through symphony concerts and lectures on music. Its original impulse sprang perhaps more from the head than the heart, but it would not be fair, therefore, to say that New Englanders approach music only from the intellectual standpoint. I have seen very emotional outbursts among Boston audiences, both at my Wagner recitals and years after when I returned with the Damrosch Opera Company to give the Wagner music dramas. While it is possible that they felt heartily ashamed of these enthusiasms afterwards and exclaimed, is this Boston? The fact remains that even a Bostonian is human, like other Americans, and needs only to be encouraged to prove that he too has a heart which can beat warmly and respond to the emotions kindled by art. Their capacity for friendship in the finest sense of the word is wonderful, and I achieved many of my dearest friends at that time. We have all grown much older since then, with the exception of Mrs. Gardner, on whom the years leave no imprint, and whose enthusiasms for life and art flame just as brightly today as then. I was certainly very young in those days, and remember, after one of my lectures, which had gone off with great enthusiasm, walking along Boylston Street toward my hotel, thinking in my young conceit that I was evidently a good deal of a personage, when I saw that the street was filled with crowds of people, and the police were making a passage with difficulty so as to allow an open carriage drawn by two horses to pass through. In it sat a rather stout, smooth-shaven gentleman with a very shiny high silk hat, and the people were cheering him like mad. Who is this? I asked a bystander. He gave me a contemptuous look and stopped cheering just long enough to say, Don't you know John L. Sullivan when you see him? I accepted the rebuke meekly and entered my hotel a much more modest man than I had left it a few hours before. John L. Sullivan, Boston's greatest citizen, had just come home from a fight in London, but I do not know to this day whether he had won or lost. 
The Boston Orchestra was at that time conducted by Wilhelm Gericke, who had brought it to a remarkable state of proficiency. I found him to be a very likable man, a thorough musician, and always gentle and friendly in his attitude. I used to envy him because, while I had to maintain my orchestra at that time by my own exertions, he had a great philanthropist behind him. His orchestra was engaged by the year, played under no other conductor, and assembled every morning at 9.30, like clockwork, for rehearsal. Garricka brought the orchestra up to a high standard of virtuosity. His sense of values was absolute, and under his training, and greatly assisted by Franz Gneisel, his concertmaster, the strings soon acquired great unanimity and a ravishing quality of tone. His readings were always musicianly, although I felt occasionally that they were too reserved. He had a horror of the exaggeration of the brass instruments, and perhaps erred on the other side in subduing them too much. But when he returned, years after, for another five years in Boston, his readings had gained in freedom and elasticity, and the balance of the different choirs seemed perfectly adjusted. Boston, and indeed the country, owes him much. He was fortunate in his opportunities, but he proved himself worthy of them. Rightly or wrongly, Major Higginson had made it his rule to engage none but German conductors for his orchestra. He had gained his first enthusiasm for symphonic music as a young man in Vienna, and had got the idea firmly in his mind that only Germany could give his orchestra the leaders which it required. Among the long line of conductors who came and went, not all, naturally, were of equal worth. A few were distinctly second raters, and I remember one whose blustering incompetence and conceit finally so enraged Major Higginson that, as the gentleman would not resign when requested, because his contract still had another year to run, Higginson sent him a check for the entire amount and dismissed him. Curiously enough, the impetus which the reputation of having been conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra gave was so great that it landed him in two other American orchestras, one of which he brought to the very verge of ruin, and the other he ruined altogether, so that the city which had founded it and lavished hundreds of thousands upon it is now without any symphony orchestra and seems to have lost the courage to begin again. But among the conductors of the Boston Orchestra, two stand out as among the best that Europe has sent over. These are Arthur Nikisch and Dr. Karl Muck. The one died last winter, beloved and mourned by the musical public of all Europe and of North and South America. The other was sent from our country back to Germany after the war and deserved disgrace, after having been interned as prisoner of war at Fort Oglethorpe. When I first met Arthur Nikisch in 1887, he was conductor at the Leipzig Opera House. I had gone there to attend an annual meeting and festival of the Tonkunstler Verein, an association of which Franz Liszt had always been the president and which had originally been formed by a small group of Liszt Wagner Berlioz adherents, of whom my father was one. One of the features of the festival was a stage performance of Berlioz's Benvenuto Cellini, given in honor of Liszt. The work fascinated me, and his performance under the young Nikisch delighted me beyond words. In appearance he already had the same characteristics which his enemies decried, but which among his friends only aroused a delighted chuckle when he appeared on the platform, and which quickly changed to a hurricane of enthusiasm after he had demonstrated his marvelous skill as an interpreter. I refer to the long black lock which always hung low over his forehead, and his still long white cuffs, which more and more enveloped his little white hands as the performance progressed. Garricka had developed the orchestra into a perfect instrument, and when Nikisch arrived he played upon it like a virtuoso. I have always maintained that Nikisch achieved still greater mastery during his years in America, because until then he had had no such orchestra at his disposal. The much vaunted Leipzig Gewandhaus and the Berlin Philharmonic, which he conducted, suffer from the troubles common to all cooperative organizations. Their members outstay their period of usefulness and retain permanent places in the orchestra after they should give way to younger and better men. 
The readings of Nikish were distinctly personal and therefore, because they reflected his own nature, so ingratiating that I have often enjoyed certain of his interpretations, although I considered them wrong and contrary to the intentions of the composer. Nikish made them convincing for the moment. Dr. Mook, who became conductor of the Boston Symphony some years later, was less personal in his readings. His principal work in Germany had been the conducting of opera, and occasionally a lack of routine in symphonic work showed itself in badly combined programs, but only in that one respect. As a conductor of the symphonies of Beethoven and Brahms, he was a master, and to me his interpretations of Brahms rank among the finest that I have heard. It was a tragedy that this man, who had gained not only the confidence and respect of his patron, Major Higginson, to a greater degree than any other of the Boston conductors, who was admired not only in Boston, but in every city which the orchestra visited, and to whom America had given unbounded acclaim, should at the crucial moment have proved himself a supercilious, arrogant Prussian of the worst Junker type, ungrateful toward the man to whom he owed his many successful years in America, and finally even an abject coward and renegade to the country to which he owed national allegiance. The story in its entirety is too unpleasant to be told, but as after Mook's return to Germany he saw fit to indulge in the most violent diatribes against America and its treatment of him, it is justifiable to tell a little of the truth in these pages. In order to understand the story properly, it is necessary to recall the excitement which swept through the country when we finally entered the Great War. Wars arouse prejudice as well as patriotism, and suspicion as well as faith. One of the curious, almost pathological results of the psychosis of war is the spy mania, and this manifested itself in the years of 1917 and 18 to a remarkable extent in America as well as in Europe. One need only recall the many stories of concrete tennis courts which were discovered and vouched for by reputable people as having been built years before by German army officers who, disguised as rich American financiers, had constructed lavish country places along the Atlantic seaboard, all of which possessed these remarkable concrete tennis courts. These were to support great guns, which at the proper moment were to put the American Navy out of existence. There were also wonderful stories of secret wires discovered in private houses and of strange beacon lights suddenly flaming up at regular intervals along the coast in order to signal messages to some mysterious German submarine. It was all like a war novel of Oppenheim, and as some of our ladies joined the Secret Service in an unofficial capacity, they together with others who conceived it to be the height of faithlessness to our country to enjoy a symphony of Beethoven or an opera of Wagner while we were at war with Germany had a beautiful time in the happy illusion that they were doing real war work. Dr. Muck immediately became a center of suspicion. He had taken a cottage at Seal Harbor, Maine for the summer of 1917, and of course he was immediately accused of having a wireless outfit and signaling to a whole fleet of German submarines which were cruising off Mount Desert Island, and whose immediate object was, of course, to capture all the millionaires of Bar Harbor and hold them captives for huge ransoms. According to others, he had placed a telephone receiver in the cellar of his house in Boston, which skillfully tapped the wire of the telephone of the lady next door, and she, to her horror, had one morning on lifting her telephone in order to call up her butcher, heard his guttural German voice conversing with some mysterious German at the other end about a shipment of dynamite, which was to be used, of course, to destroy Faneuil Hall and the birthplace of Henry W. Longfellow in Maine. There was not a story so wild that it did not gain credence, but it was not so strange that many of these preposterous rumors should center around Dr. Mook. His attitude toward us had become more and more supercilious. That he should sympathize with his own country was perhaps natural, but that he should use some tact and reticence in this respect was equally to be expected. He might have taken an example from Fritz Chrysler, 
who, as an Austrian citizen, served at the beginning of the war in the Austrian army, but was retired and returned to this country before we entered the conflict. From then on, he acted with such dignity and tact, giving up all plain and public during that critical period, that he retained the personal respect and affection of all right-thinking Americans. As the war situation became more and more serious, Dr. Mook seemed to become more and more supercilious. In response to a perfectly natural impulse, the public demanded that our orchestras begin or end their concerts with the playing of the national anthem. This had become the symbol of our patriotism, and as millions of our young men began to gather in the camps and to be sent abroad in the transports, the Star-Spangled Banner was beginning to awaken in every heart emotions that were hardly known to our generation before the war. Dr. Mook refused to play the anthem, not from Boston nor New York, alas, but from Providence, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. Angry mutterings began to be heard. These cities insisted that an orchestra which, in time of war, was not willing to play our national anthem should not be permitted to play at all. Dr. Mook's answer to this, in a newspaper interview, was that he conducted an artistic institution, that the Star Spangled Banner is not a work of art, and therefore only fit to be played by ballroom orchestras and military bands. Up till then I had upheld Dr. Mook insofar as it seemed just as bad taste for him as a German to conduct our national anthem in time of war with his country as it was for our public to insist that a German should do so. He could have said, I am a German, my country is at war with yours. I am your guest because in 1915 Major Higginson insisted that I should return to America as he thought that the orchestra could not exist without me. I am now in an unfortunate position. Let me retire from conducting here during the war, or at least let your national anthem be conducted by the concertmaster. But this interview was a flippant invasion of the real point at issue, and when the reporter of the New York Tribune brought it to me, I exclaimed that I did not believe Dr. Mook could have said anything so outrageous, whereupon the reporter told me that his editor had expected me to say this and had therefore telegraphed to Boston and obtained a confirmation of the interview. I then expressed myself in very plain language regarding Dr. Mook's attitude, but his only answer was a new interview in which he declared that it was all a mistake, that he was not a German but a Swiss. This belated claim, which was based on technicalities and contrary to the facts, was promptly denied by the Swiss minister in Washington, and then suddenly Dr. Mook proceeded to conduct the Star-Spangled Banner, but in listless fashion, although half a dozen cities by that time barred their doors to him and the concerts of the orchestra had to be cancelled. In the meantime, the Secret Service men of the government had been patiently following every rumor and clue regarding Mook's supposed spy activities, and while they discovered that his attitude toward us was absolutely inimical, and that he was therefore decidedly persona non grata, there was no foundation of truth in the rumors connecting him with wires, wireless, beacon lights, dynamite, or German submarines. The Secret Service men, however, discovered other disagreeable things in regard to him, which had no connection with the war, but which made him liable under the laws of our country. An incriminating package of letters was shown to him, and on his acknowledgment that he had written them, he was given the choice of internment as a prisoner of war at Fort Oglethorpe, or of being arrested on another charge and brought before the civil courts for trial. He naturally threw up his hands and accepted the former as a lesser evil. As he was released after the war on condition that he returned to his own country, I cannot see that he has cause for anything but gratitude toward this country and its lenient treatment of him. The whole affair was a terrible shock to Major Higginson. He was an old man, and the discoveries regarding Dr. Mook, in whom he had placed such confidence and for whom he had vouched so absolutely, were unendurable to him. He had expected to continue his support of the orchestra, and it was generally assumed that he would leave the organization an endowment sufficient to maintain it after his death. Instead of this, he announced his determination to withdraw altogether, and left the decision whether they wished to continue the orchestra with a group of music lovers whom he had called together. For a time, its future was in great doubt 
out. Thirty of the players were discharged because of their German nationality, but money was subscribed by various Boston citizens to rebuild the orchestra, and today, under the leadership of Pierre Monteux, it is fast regaining its old excellence. It will never again occupy the unique position it held 25 years and more ago, because since then so many other symphony orchestras have been founded in America on similar lines and with similar generous endowments. But to Major Higginson will all always belong the glory of having blazed the trail. He set the standard, and America will give his memory loving reverence and gratitude. End of section 25